Hey gang, it's KR King of D&D Homebrew talking today about lessons of the Mad Mage's level 6 dungeon. And I'm doing this, you know, I have this series that I did for a long time and I kind of let it go for a couple of reasons. One, I was kind of doing very in-depth videos on this when I first started. If you watch, they go from like four videos for the first level and maybe maybe three for the second or, you know, whatever. They, they go down because they're very time consuming. And, you know, originally they didn't get that many views, that many people were interested and I was doing it not so much to run the module. I was talking, I would call them secrets of the Mad Mage or lessons of the setup and all this stuff. Because the idea was to create videos that showed you some of the things that designers use when they're making a mega dungeon that you can incorporate into your own dungeons. Some of the lessons, you know, the, the good things and the bad things that I see in this very famous and, you know, popular dungeon that you can apply to your own. What happened along the way is I've got a lot of commenters that are running the Dungeon of the Mad Mage who've told me, hey, I really like this, really helping me set my, you know, things up for my players and whatnot, how to make the levels more interesting, you know, how to think about these encounters. And they've asked me to do it, and then I did a poll on my channel, and it was something like 50, over 50% wanted me to continue with these, and then another certain percentage said, hey, we, we want you to do this and other modules we'll see in the future. So I've returned again. This is lessons of level six because really it's designed, as I say, to help you run any kind of, you know, mega dungeon with the interconnected levels and things to make sense and how to get back and forth in those dungeons, but just in also encounter designs that, that occur in dungeons. All right, so I'm going to use the basic six categories that I always do to examine these dungeons. We have entrances and exits. We have, you know, the, the, do you need to explore the entire level? We have resource drains as opposed to monsters that are guarding something that are purely just there to, you know, lower the player's hit points and spells. We have uh, major NPCs on the level as opposed to the resource drain monsters. We also have interlevel connectivity in terms of this is, obviously, it's a mega dungeon. What, what's transpiring? What's going back and forth? What, and does it make sense? And then finally, dynamic versus static, as I always talk about, is this dungeon a living thing? Does it seem as though things are there in a sensible way, as opposed to just plopped into the rooms waiting for the players? I usually start with entrances and exits anyway, but here it's very uh, important because this is called a lost level. The setup is these Umber Hulks have come along and popped out an entrance in level five that the players can go through. Then there's another entrance to level seven, the conventional uh, levels. So you think, oh, well, no one's been here. So therefore, you know, what kind of monsters would be here? Things like Umber Hulks or Zorns, as we'll see, that can travel through the earth, anything like that. Or constructs, there's a clay golem, this kind of thing. But in fact, this place is a hub for gates. There's 11 gates on this level which is more far more than any other level and they starting at level two going up to the various before this sixth level and then going down to the seventh eighth and tenth i think <laughs> again you know this is the thing these gates and the gates as you know halisters put these runes on the gates every time you go through there's a woe or wheel thing i've talked about these gates before where they you know they have some real <laughs> screw job effects as I've said, I, the, the, the benefits in some ways don't outweigh the, you know, the, the bad things. There's only so many that they have in the book. Maybe you could make up your own. But there's a couple of things here. You know, you have to have, if you're going to have a mega dungeon, this one's 23 levels. You, you don't want the players to go, unless they're just going to live in the dungeon for some reason. But if they're going to go do other things or leave or take rests, or you're not going to take long rests or even, you know, you level up in the dungeon, depending on how you run your world, they're going to go back and forth. Well, once they start to get to the lower levels, they're going to want to use gates. And so they have this level with a, a hub kind of thing where you can come down from the second and go to this one and then explore some of the other ones. And then on the first level, there's one all the way down, I think to the 10th, I'm pretty sure, that you can just avoid all of these once you've explored them all, presumably. This is the way a mega dungeon, I think, has to work. You have to have a means for the players to just start going to these lower levels because you don't want to wind your way all the way through. But the thing is, Halister the Mad Mage is punishing people to go through here and he's putting these runes on. Now, once the rune has been activated, either going through or coming back, 
Halaster has to do a symbol spell on it to reactivate. So in theory, it never says this in the book. Could someone have been through here recently and Halaster hasn't put a symbol on the gate? Or does he always just do this on the minute he sees, well, how many symbols does he have? I mean, he does have a spell cast or things. And this is the issue with these gates. If you're going to have, the, let's just say you say, for whatever reason, the, the rune is automatically regenerated. Well, then it becomes a real pain every time you got to use these, right? Because you can really have something that affects you for 24 hours or something or hurts you really bad. Again, it might give you a benefit. Is it, and it isn't always the first person through. If you try to have somebody that can take the hit points or whatever, it could be the, anybody in the party. Think about this. If you're going to have these, I tend to say, I'll give the players some kind of item uh, that will that will allow them to go through the gates, especially now that you're at this point in their level. They're supposed to be ninth level, that they can just they can just pass through the gates without without in, invoking this this penalty. Again, Halister is pretty powerful. You may not want to do that. You may say, you know, after a certain point, like, he doesn't do this for 24 hours or something, so they can go back and forth. You can put a randomizer. Has someone been through here? Whatever. Because again, if you do this every time, it's annoying. It's just an added kind of potential. Again, it can be a boom. I get it. But I just feel like, you know, if I was setting this up, I would make these gates a little less problematic. Or as I say, they say in their symbol spell, how often would he carry those? So so again, if the players have gone through here, presumably they can go back that day and not have the rune effect. The other thing about these gates is there's, in terms of activating them, the means to do so are not very obvious. But they have one where they have a mural of dwarves dancing, and you're supposed to be imitate their dance in front of it for a minute, and then it opens. Well, I suppose the players might try different things to open these. Maybe by this time they've learned if they've used any of the gates, there are these kind of things. You know, and then some you've got to stand invisible for a minute in front of it. Another one you've got to be levitating or flying within five feet of the gate. Another one has a dragon's mouth. You have to put a gemstone or the hundred gold pieces or more. Now, the thing is, is that you can use a legend lore. It says in the introductory to the whole module, you can use a legend lore spell to figure out what, what it needs. That's a fifth level spell. And the players are supposed to be ninth level. It's the first time they have a fifth level spell. They're going to take a legend lore? I don't think so, right? So they're going to sit there, and how long do you want to play with this? If Because, again, they're at the point now where they want to use these gates. So, for instance, if they are traveling from the gate at level 2 to this level, level 6, because they have to be ninth level, which presumably they are, they have to learn how to activate that gate, which is to touch a non-magical ferris. There's this engraving of a rust monster over it, and then it turns, it totally dissolves, it turns into dust, and then the gate is open for one minute. Again, whatever, however they figured that out, they know they have to do these kind of things in order to open the gates. Uh, maybe your party can figure it out. Maybe they'll just look at this and go, oh, I know exactly what this is. And dancing dwarves will dance like dwarves. <sighs> you know, I just feel like maybe I would make the gates, if, you're, if the group is not doing this, you know, arcana checks, history checks, something. How are you going to facilitate this if you're playing this rules as written so that they can get through? And then not only do they have to figure that out, then they have the rune thing to deal with as well. So I think the gates, you know, I love the idea. You've got to have gates or elevators or something at these mega dungeons to, to uh, you know, facilitate the players moving forth. I think there's just some flaws in this. Now, as I said, with the dynamic versus static in this lost dungeon, you'd think everything was static. It just been broken through by the Umber Hulks. And there's a party of, we'll see, Durgar that have come through here. But everything else, presumably, either can travel through the earth. There's a Zorn in there, or a couple of them, I think. There's a Cloaker in there. How it got there, not sure. But again, you know, or maybe it came through with the Durgar because it's with them. But the thing is, you've got all these NPCs, presumably, using the gates. And here's the thing with the static versus dynamic. If you are transported to this level, and that's as far as you can go, you're going to explore it. Why has no one else explored it? Why are all these gems lying around, right? Why is anything lying around? Why aren't people... In I mean, and again, they tell you the Yawning Portal has all these adventurers going up and down, paying their gold piece to explore. Presumably, people have gotten to the level of the gate at level two, or there's other gates too, uh, beforehand, and they have gone through and seen this level. And then, yeah, there's other gates, but they can't use any of the other ones. They're going to just... They're not going to go back and forth. They're going to explore the level. So it's a little confusing to me why there are not NPCs, why there's not more evidence of people 
having explored and or looted this level. And also the Zorn, why are there gems around? The Zorn just want to eat gems all the time. Why haven't they looted the various gem sites that are in this dungeon? That It's a little bit, you know, I mean, because like they are. Because um, Halister prevents them from doing it. Because Halister just let them in. Because, you know, this is always the thing with the Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Halister allows you to just excuse anything. But unless you're going to have a Halister type figure, you're going to have to think about that. You know, these are the sort of things that I guarantee you players are going to think about this after they've run through and kind of go, you know, why is that? doesn't really make sense. So even though you'd think a lost dungeon level would be totally static, everything just their constructs or whatever or things that travel through the earth. In fact, with these gates, it kind of falls apart. So the major NPCs here, this party of Durgar that are exploring this evil dwarves. And of course, this is the, the whole premise of this level is this, this dwarven tomb, this dwarven temple with the tomb of the king of the dwarves. And in his temple is the heart of the mountain and all this. So there's eight Drugar in here, uh, standard CR1, I think. There's two cloakers, which can be very nasty if they get around you. And then the Skella, who's basically a double strength uh, Drugar, obviously the Drugar can be invisible, right, when they first attack you. It doesn't say that they are, but if they hear you, there's a there's an organ in another room that if you play it, it, you know, goes in this room and they can come and see you. And then there's a couple other Drugar that are sort of scavenging, but they're quite far apart. So you look at this with them, I, I'd say it's a hard encounter. Again, she may just negotiate. She They say that she wants to talk to you and negotiate, and they're technically lawful evil if you play lawful like they'll make promises and stuff it's not that deadly of an encounter there they are the major ones the rest tend to be except for one other one tend to be um uh, just resource drain type monsters that are just there we'll talk about the gray slot that are hanging around they are deadly uh especially there's two of them two together is quite nasty uh but these this is this power setter because again it's a lost level the second major NPC are these demons, and they are trapped in pillars in room 40, I think. Now, here's the thing about this. What happens is the, one, of the, one of the demons can communicate telepathically, and it tries to convince the players, let me out of here, and I will give you access to this treasure room. I know how to do it. And it will do it. It'll dispel this magic wall that's preventing anyone from going through. But if the players let this demon through, and then it's going to let them go into this room, presumably. But it's a demon. It's a Glabizu, which if you look, is a very nasty CR9 demon. All sorts of spells, all sorts of abilities. Now, it's going to appear. It cannot alter its form. It's got these giant claws. I mean, the players, get, but they may say, hey, go ahead. I, I promised you this. No problem. I'm free. I just want out. Then they go in. Well, it says in the text it's going to wait for them and whatnot. But here's the other thing. There's three other pillars. If this Glabrizu, if that's how you pronounce it, chooses to, it can knock pillars over. Probably one action to knock it over. It's very strong. The players hear this crashing. Will they return? And it can throw a darkness spell and prevent their movement first. These other demons are deadly. A Baro Gula. Uh, a Vrock and a Hezrau. And if you look at the stats on these things, if if there's even one other of these, much less f four, that's a beyond deadly encounter. That's a TPK encounter. Now you can argue, well, the players should be able to, I'll do a percept, you know, a wisdom check, insight to see if this thing's lying. Because how do you do this, you might say. It doesn't give you any information on how it tries to trick the players, but suppose it says, oh, I'm a dwarven princess and I'm trapped, or a dwarven priest, or however it does it. Please help me. All you got to do is knock over this and you can release me. I've been waiting, right? And so they make a, you know, do they believe this? Do you allow them just to make a check? And suppose, you know, you're behind your screen, they roll a three. And they say, oh, no, it's really, it seems like a princess. And so they knock it over. They're potentially screwed. There's potential there. Even four ninth level characters, you know, that's tough. If it gets any of these other demons, they're, they're in trouble. And it's all based on this knocking over, you know, fooling them to release them. So I'm not sure about this setup. This is like the ultimate save or suck kind of thing, right? Either you realize, no, it's lying, or you're potentially in big trouble. Now, it can't alter its form. So you're like, oh my God, this is a demon. 
what do we do? And the demon says, hey, no, no, I made my promise. I have promised to give you this. Thank you so much. You may go on. Maybe they wait for the demon to leave. Maybe it does leave the room. But, you know, again, maybe it rushes one of the columns and knocks it over. Now you got two demons on your hand. And even if you're blasting them, check out the stats on these things. They're nasty. So I would say that's the major NPC if it's released. If not, it's the uh, Drugar who are, you know, they're tough with the cloakers and stuff. There's a potential there not to fight them at all. If you make a mistake with these demons, you're in trouble. And the other monsters are basically resource drains. We have some gray slods, two of them together. That's a deadly encounter. The other two are sort of wandering apart. Of course, they have this invisibility feature, but you run into those two together. They're at one of the gates. You run into those, and that's a nasty encounter. But they're just there. And again, you come through the gate from two. There they are. Presumably, you're ninth level. But your group comes in through the gate, and they're gonna, they're, they've been assigned by Halister to kill all adventures. That's their goal. So, again, that, 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 that's an encounter that could turn into troublesome. Again, if you're running this with five characters or six, that changes. There's a design for four. But that could be a nasty little battle. The other ones, obviously Umber Hulks, there's a potential to run into two at one time. That's a, you know, a hard encounter, maybe medium hard, depending on the party composition. You've got some other ones. They're kind of the standard random monsters, although it says if you've killed a couple, then they don't appear. You've got a clay golem that typically, like clay golems everywhere, if you leave the area, it stops attacking, goes back to what it's protecting. Uh, but obviously, you know, you, you've still got to, if you want to go get that the treasure there, then... <laughs> you've got to kill it. There's an undead billet. It's in this this pit, uh, which, you know, is, it's, it's billet. You know, you can look at their stats. It's a little, it's a resource drain, right? Uh, you've also got uh, protecting a big beast hand spell. That does 48 damage. Uh, it doesn't have a spell attack on it listed. And this it's usually a spell caster. So it's a fifth level spell. So presumably if it's, let's say, a ninth level Spellcaster, that's a plus four proficiency. What's their intelligence? Maybe it's, you know, 18. That would be plus eight. If Halister casts the spell, that's a plus 14. That spell attack's going to hit and do 48 damage. So, you know, it's, that's potential. But it doesn't say you have to decide that yourself. The level also has a whole bunch of pit traps that do pretty good damage. There's one that does acid damage and you... You, the longer you're stuck in the trap, so you take the fall damage, you take acid damage, and then all the time, every turn you're in the trap, you uh, are, you know, take the damage, and you can't climb out without climbing equipment. There's no way. So again, depending on who's down, you're going to have to put ropes down or something to get them out. They're going to just take this damage. Again, draining the hit points, draining the heal spells. There's another thing that's a trash compact, or it's a pit in the floor, and there's a lever that says crush, and then, you know, it opens, and then you can lift up you know, the lever thing where it's obvious what it does, it doesn't seem like much of a trap. I tend to like traps in dungeons, you know, and, and again, especially with a Halister figure making them, he can make all sorts of clever traps. So I, I would say I, I don't mind traps at all if they're explainable. And also that they, once they've been, you know, they, they do something or whatever and they go back and they reset, right, sometimes. Because again, the dynamic versus static, presumably this trap resets itself after it's been engaged, somehow, that's why Halister's so convenient, you know, as the source of everything in this dungeon. Another question always is, should the players search through every nook and cranny of the dungeon? And there's typically two reasons for this. One, treasure. And sure enough, the treasure is sprinkled all throughout this level also, are there items that you need for future levels? Interestingly, there's this dagger uh, of blind sight um, that's from level two, Azrock the uh, was it Hobgoblin or Bugbear, I think, <laughs> whatever. Uh, it needs this, you know, it was, he, he was losing his power. His mother was protecting him, but he, because he was blind. I think there was Hobgoblin. They would just kill him right away. So you could be sent down here, get this item, take it back and restore him. On the other hand, <laughs> blind sight dagger is pretty nice to have. You don't have to go back and give it, right? Especially like if you're, like, so you're fighting these demons and it throws the darkness spell, which is a very great tactical spell. With a blind sight dagger, you can see. 
So again, you know, that's something that is connected to level two, but it's just here. The Durgar stole it from them and came down, and have, they have it in uh, room 15 when you meet. Skella has that. Then it has a sentinel shield, which is nice. Uh, it gives you advantage on initiative. <laughs> two rolls for initiative. That is nice. And advantage on wisdom checks, which is also very nice. So that's a powerful item. And then it has a scroll of mass cure wounds, which is, you know, always useful. There's a crystal crown, uh, this infant that's in a crib made out of gold. And if you take it off, it turns into this crystal crown, which if you wear, uh, you have access to two of the gates, which is really nice. Presumably, you just walk to the gates wearing the crown. I don't know. No, you put it on. And again, you're going through with these gates Trying this, trying that. I wave this, I do that. This can be, some players might find this the greatest fun they've ever had playing D&D. Others are going to be like, oh my God, we got to figure this out. Because it's only a legend lore that just tells you. There's also a mouthpiece for a tuba that's in this music room. The issue there, of course, is it's just worth money. The tuba's less valuable. It doesn't have any magical powers or anything. You, just, you can't blow through it and get the full value for the tuba. There's another thing, there's these doors that only open if you take the desiccated, mummified hand of this dwarven king and then you place it on the doors. Otherwise, it says no magic, nothing can open these doors. Again, how do the players figure that out? It isn't like they just find the hand. It's one thing to just you leave a hand. Or it's another that there's handprints, you know, inset, <laughs> right, concave on this door or something like that. Maybe the players just figure this out. You know, maybe they you give them kind of history checks or something on this, or they just figure that out. It's the kind of thing that, to me, is a little bit of a stumbling block. It's a little like, as I've talked about, those old computer games where if you don't find some item, you know, you lose. And it's not vital to the, you know, continuing on with the, the dungeon, but it's one of those things we never figured out the black basalt there. Black basalt doors, they wouldn't open. We never figured it out. And it kind of bugs players, right? Because what was that? What is going on? But maybe they just continue to search and search and they find the desiccated corpse and they say, hey, let's take... But how do they know just pushing on it with hands is what does it? You think it's a magic thing or something? So you're really going to take the hand, cut it off, the mummified hand, place it on the door, maybe. And you've seen all these things with dwarven abilities on them. So you got a dwarf in your party, it doesn't make any difference. It's got to be the hand of the king. That's a little... And then finally, we have interconnectivity. As I say, in a dynamic dungeon where there are entrances and exits leading to other levels, and here you have gates, what about the dungeon shows you as a player that it's that it's truly connected, that, that, that there are things that are going on that the earlier levels. Azrock's dagger is the most obvious. Here it is. It's been deposited here. There's a key that you can find, but it's also it uses on the same level. The main interconnectivity with this is the physical make, you know, construction of the dungeon such that it's a hub, right? It's a hub for all these levels. So high level NPCs come through here. You could say, well, how many are there really? Even though there's this yawning portal. Well, this is the sixth out of 23 levels. So presumably there would be a lot of higher level NPCs coming through here. Again, that's the sort of thing. It's a lost level. It doesn't have the... Uh, just recently, the Umber Hulks have taken, you know, from the 5th to the 7th. So you're not going to have a lot of interconnectivity among monsters or creatures that are that can't use the gate. A lost level is going to not have much interconnectivity. So one of the things they say in the aftermath of all this is, if you release this demon, and let's say you run away, you get somehow, it lets you go if you decide to do that. They're going to run, they're going to prop these things over, they're going to run this level, right? And the Durgar are going to continue to search... They haven't yet found that because there's a bunch of like uh, uh, fake uh, burial chambers for the king that was buried here. So eventually they're going to loot the whole thing. So you either, what do you, you say, go away? I don't think so. You're going to fight him probably. So that's kind of the end point of this level. It's not one of the better levels in my opinion. Uh, again, three items. Some of the, like I said, that Sentinel Shield is pretty nice. Yeah, none of them are bad. Of course, you're going to give the one back to Azrock, maybe. But I would say the major lessons are think about gates. Think about that means you have in your mega dungeon. And think about when you're building an encounter, do you have a 
kind of a saver suck. If you release those demons and they, that demon manages to get the other three out, even one or two, you've got a potential real problem. All right, so that's my review. If you like what you've seen, please subscribe to my channel. I'm always looking for more. Love to hear comments. I love to hear about people that use these videos to, you know, explore the or run the Dungeon of the Mad Mage for their group. I also like to hear from people with ideas about the sort of dungeon design that you see with this level. But most importantly, my friends, just keep playing an RPG game, whichever one you choose, and tell somebody else about it.